Hey guys, how you doing? This is Joseph Ott here. Uh, I'm here with, of course, media maestro Chris Wills and what's, uh, up, what's up? The legendary Stretch uh, from uh, Hip Hop Weekly, and uh, we're here um, for the uh, My Talent Checklist podcast. Yeah, episode and one, episode one of the My Talent Checklist podcast, um, and we're all very excited to be here today. Absolutely, and absolutely. And, and so we aim here on this uh, program to provide aspiring entertainers with uh, legal and business strategic advice about the things that they need to have on their checklist to have long-term profitable business success uh, and ultimately to grow their art to the place that uh, they, they want to have it at. And um, so we're excited to have Travis as our guest today. Um, Travis, why don't you, uh, start us off and and tell us a little bit about your history with music. Well, my history, um, actually starts back, um, as a kid, you know, uh, seven, eight years old. Um, my uncle was a, a, a big time promoter in my hometown and he used to bring, you know, guys like Big Daddy Kane, Biz Markey, you know what I'm saying? Um, Dougie Fresh, Kid and Play. You know, all, all the old school guys, you know, uh, to the city. And, you know, I was little seven, eight. I probably shouldn't have been there. And what city there. were you talking about, Stretch? I was born in Niagara Falls, New York. So we're talking Niagara Falls, New York. So you're from the uh, so you're from the birth mecca of hip hop. Well, the state. Yeah. You know, I don't want to. Yeah. For, I'm, I'm upstate New York, you know. and Absolutely. You know, hip hop was born in the Bronx, was was in the city, which is part of the borough. So it's it's kind of like two completely different. If you ever been upstate New York and you've been downstate, you know it's a difference. But we still got that energy. You know what I'm saying? That we still got that that feeling of the hip hop up here. Um, it, it just it's just a little different. But you know, it was a venue called the Turtle, and um, you know all the uh, he used to bring all the top artists at the time through. And you know, like I said, I'm seven, eight years old. Probably shouldn't have been there. And ever since that point, just seeing them rock the mic and seeing the, the energy and seeing how the crowd react. I knew I wanted to get involved with music somehow, some way. But of course, at seven to eight, you don't know how it's going to be. Yeah, but I knew yeah. I wanted to do something along those lines. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. Do you have uh, like a, a first show or something that, that really sticks out in your mind is, is uh, the moment you knew? Big Daddy Kane. Big Daddy Kane came in. Um, he did a show. And it's funny because... Uh, one of his girlfriends who came down and um, every time he performed, she would unplug the speaker because she was mad at him. <laughs> like, that's, that's just vividly my brain. Every time, you know, and it, you know, security would push her away and they never kicked her out. And then they plug it back up. He'd start rapping again. She runs it back up. She unplugs it again. <laughs> like, it, it was like that. It was so, but it, it was like, it, it was almost like it was a part of the show because the crowd was engaging in it. You know, they was cheering and it was like, Oh, you know what's going on. But, from that point, like I said, it was just, and I think that was my first show. I knew that I wanted to do something. So I couldn't rap. I couldn't sing. So, you know, I actually started off um, breakdancing. So I was a little break. Oh, oh okay. okay. That's cool. You still break dance? No, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> that was like 40, 50 pounds ago, but they used to call me King Tut. <laughs> so, so that, uh, that, that memory that you have with big, big daddy Kane, was that the underground upcoming big daddy Kane or when he had actually hit the limelight? was right before he got ready to hit the limelight it was right there he, people knew who he were um you know of course where we were at I, you know i'm assuming you know back then you know it's no social media of course but that was right before you know he had a couple of videos out you know he was he was big daddy he was Kane. buzzing yeah, he was buzzing he was i don't he wasn't big 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 daddy came but he was he was right there oh okay that's really i mean if people know the history of hip-hop that's one of the grandfathers of, of hip-hop oh yeah yeah, so that that's really inspiring to hear that uh, that story from you. Uh, yeah, stretch. it's it's cool to see. You know, you had him uh, and you saw him right before he blew up, right? And so you've probably seen that time and again throughout your career, and you can you can tell when the artist is ready, right? Absolutely, you know, and you know, and as a promoter, you know, you you kind of uh, you want to catch them on the way up because the price is a little cheaper. You know what uh, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, it, it, it was kind of my job. Okay, he's hot, he's hot, but he's not that hot. So let's book him. You know what I'm saying? Let's book him because he's about to go through the roof. So let's get him now. So you got to kind of pay attention to that. And, you know, and to this day, 
I still do that with, you know, up and coming artists. Like, okay, he's hot. You know what I'm saying? So, so you knew that you wanted to be part of the music industry at a, at an early age, uh, back in the Big Daddy Kane era. So yeah. a, as you got into your teens uh, and early twenties, tell us about that time frame uh, of how you developed your skill set and and what actually um, lane that you took uh, to get involved with the music industry and the, and just music in in general. It started off with doing talent shows. I was uh, a senior in high school, um, 18 years old. Um, so at that point, I knew I wanted to get into promotions because, you know, that was my uncle's was going. I said, well, hey, I can do the same thing. You know, and by that time, we talking early 90s. So the music kind of changed a little bit. So, you know, at this point, you know, you got the biggies out. You know what I'm saying? Tupac days, he's dropping. Wu-Tang, you know, Mob Deep. So it's around that area. We're talking like 96, 97. So it was a talent show. Um, so... What better way to find talent than a talent show? You know what I'm saying? So that was the first event I did was a, was a talent show, and it was it was successful. You know, people came out. They loved it. Um, and at the same time, I had started a, a independent record label called On Point Entertainment. So um, a couple of my artists that was signed to me actually participated in the talent show as well. Um, so, you know, and they were relative. They are relative. So they kind of thought I was going to let them win the talent show because they were signed to me, but I didn't want it. people to be like, oh, the fight is fixed. So I didn't let them win. It was a little heated at me, but. <laughs> right. Well, at least you played a fair game. I had to play it fair. You know, you know I got to see these people, you know, every day in the street. So it was, I didn't want to fight the fight. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm watching the talent and I'm also watching them and how they're engaging with the crowd. So I'm de- like developing them at the same time, at the same time watching other talent. You know what I'm saying? So it was kind of like two things working at the same time, simultaneously. So speaking of mentors, um, what, would you say that your your father or your uncles or uh, who who on the family side or a close friend, and then also on the industry side were your mentors? You, what would you say? On the family side, like well, my father my father was killed when I was seven, so you know I was he wasn't around for that type of stuff, but he was a musician, so I think I got a little of that off on you know a little of that in my blood from him. What what instrument or uh, what did he do? Music. He was a singer. Okay. He was a singer. I mean, he, you know, they used to, uh, they had little bands. They used to drive around and, you know, perform and all that. But then he went to the military and he was killed in the military um, coming home from Egypt in an airplane crash. So that was in the Sorry 85. to hear that. You know, it's all good. You know, so I got a little of that, that music from him, I think. I just didn't have that talent that he had. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So right. I had to come oh, differently. But I, I would say my, um, I got two uncles. One, you know, uh, one is his name is Ronald Cunningham. He's the one who did the Big Daddy Kane situation and all those guys. And then my uncle Kozell, uh, Kozell Farrell, he opened a nightclub and he was doing the same things. And when he opened his nightclub, I was in high school. So me and my first cousin, uh, his name is Cozy, we used to DJ. So, you know, we used to do teen night. So, you know, I, I got to see, play the music and see how the people react, you know, to the music. Oh, okay, this is hot. This is how this is what we listen to. So it's, it's always been there. You know, I was, I, was, I was always able to hear certain things, you know, as a youth all the way through, you know, to where I'm at now. You know what I mean? And on the uh, entertainment side, like the actual industry side, as you developed your uh, promotional skills and got into promotion and doing shows, who, who would you say was the first, like, person in the industry – uh, that would be basically considered your mentor? I don't know if I have an actual mentor who was like hands on with me because, you know, I had to get it from the know, mud. We had to kick, yeah, we had to kick down doors to get, you know what I'm saying? Nobody right. gave us anything. So no one came down, but hey, I'm going to pull you on my wing. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, who are these guys? Let's, let's watch, you know what I'm saying? But I would say, Ever since 96, like, you know, I always looked up to, uh, you know, to uh, uh, Jay-Z. So I, I was kind of wanted to follow his footsteps business-wise, you know what I mean? Not 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 music-wise. Of course, I can't rap, but business-wise. So I felt like, you know, kind of like the Kobe Bryant thing, you like all this time we was in high school, it's like we grew up with them, you know? So Jay-Z dropped Reasonable Doubts in 96, and it, it was almost like a blueprint of what I should do you know, not just me, myself, you know, it's, you know, my whole team, our crew who was with us at the time, same, same people who I'm partners with today. 
And it's like, it was like a blueprint of us following, you know, from that point on to here. And it's kind of ironic. Now that I thought about when y'all, when we talk about Big Daddy Kane, Big Daddy Kane is one of the people who put Jay-Z on. He opened up for him, you know, on tour. Jay, uh, Big Daddy Kane used to take Jay-Z on tour with him. So it's funny. I, you know, I never even thought about that until earlier when, when we was talking about Big Daddy Kane. But I would say, um, he don't know this, but I would say my mentor would be, you know, Jay-Z. Yeah, that's that's awesome, and and so uh, it's kind of a good segue. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about uh, you know the music business uh, and your music business a little bit? Um, and you mentioned that Jay Z had given you kind of the blueprint, and basically, you know, what we're trying to do with uh, with my town checklist is give uh, aspiring artists a blueprint to succeed. Um, and uh, we we loved being able to draw on you as a resource uh, for knowledge about the entertainment business. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how um, you started taking music as a business seriously and, and sort of the steps you were taking around that time? Yeah, it would be 18 at the same time. Um, at the same time I was doing uh, pirates and stuff, you know, I, when I launched, on, first we started off with On Point Productions. And then, um, and I had a DBA for, um, I, cause this, at the same time, I'm learning these things as I'm going. Right. Right. I always tell artists when I talk to them, like I, I got a DBA for on point productions. And then I started learning about LLCs and I'm like, man, well, I got, I need an LLC cause somebody can take my name somewhere else and, you know, do something else with it. So then I, I switched it to on point entertainment and I made, um, that was incorporated. That was an LLC. So <laughs> I really didn't know the difference between it, it, but I just know that was something I needed to do. It cost a little bit more money, but, you know, this was what I was supposed to be doing. So, you know, that's what I did. And um, I, I, I got a book called uh, uh, Music Distribution 101. Okay, cool. I read that book from beginning to end. And, you and, know, I, and what year was that book that you got? 96. This Nin- is 96. 97 i don't know exactly what so so that was before the streaming and all that so the distribution was actually um in a whole different element uh during that during those years yeah and you got to remember like i you know i'm I'm following jay-z at the same time so Mm -hmm. he he couldn't get signed you know he went to every label to turn them down so they had to print up and sell cds out their trunk Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying so that's what I did. I print up CDs and I just sold them. I went, you know, I went each corner, whoever they was at, whatever people were sitting out at whatever storefront and we selling CDs or, or cassettes at the time. And, you know, that's, we got our buzz going, you know, and that's what developed the, the distribution network. So the goal was, you know, to sell enough independently and then hopefully we can get an independent, uh, a distribution deal with a major, but it's a little harder coming from upstate New York than downstate New York. You know, it's you know, all the labels is right there. So, you know, if you buzz in, like if somebody like Jay-Z, you buzz in the streets in New York City, you know, label is going to come find you. And which they did, like, you know, Priority and Def Jam and, you know, now it's, it's where it's at. But I think if I had this same hustle and I, and I lived in that area back then, I think I would, it would have been on back then, you know, so I had to go to the long route. <laughs> right. But, you know, so uh, when did you start uh, Hip Hop Weekly? When did that come about? Oh, wow. We jump in. Uh, Hip Hop Weekly is, is years, years. That's maybe, what's that was 96. So you might be talking 2015. Oh, okay. Yeah. So so then in, in the interim, you were saying you were learning the, uh, learning the ropes of the music business. Um, can you tell us about... Uh, you know, maybe some of the struggles that you learned from during that time and, and uh, some of the stuff that you think you did well? For me, it was, um, well, for us as collectively, it was more or less uh, artists, you know, because when you, when you are, you, you just grind, no money is being made at this point, you know what I'm saying? So everything is out of my pocket. The artists are not making no money, you know, we, we're grinding. So that even the money that we, we were making off CDs is basically covering production, you know, production studio or, uh, uh, print up, you know, how much it costs, you know, to get the CDs and get the uh, manufactured product. So, you know, it's like we're breaking even. So, so you're you know, just got, flipping it right back into uh, reinvesting. Reinvesting. Now, it's cool with me, but, you know, I also got artists, you know, basically the same age as me or maybe a little bit younger. You know what I'm saying? So they're, you know, they get a little frustrated. So they started dibbling and dabbling in other things. You know what I'm saying? So, and when that one comes with that, it comes with, you know, with incarceration, it comes with death, you know, it comes with a lot of things. So I think with us, 
it was, you know, a lot of the artists I was dealing with were also dealing with other things. So, you know, and a lot of them got in trouble, you know, uh, you know, a couple not here right now. So that took over, you know what I'm saying? So at that point it's balancing like, man, like, is this ever going to happen? Or do I either go put a hundred percent into something else that I really don't want to do? You know what I mean? So it, that's been, that was going on for a few years. And finally I said, you know what, let me, you know, let me just go get a regular nine to five, you know? So I did a nine to five thing for, you know, a, a lot of you, but at the same time, I'm thinking of ways how I can get back in, you know what I'm saying? So um, I also, you know, I still continue my promotion thing. So I, I did, I owned a, a teen nightclub and I'm still doing this at the same time I'm working nine to five. Yeah. And that, yeah. that started getting a little dangerous. You know, it was, you know, kids, you know, we, we're talking early 2000s now, you know, so kids are sneaking guns and stuff into the clubs. I'm like, man, I don't want to be bothered with this no more. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> right, right. I just went totally like, hey, I'm going to get me a job. My daughter is born at the time. That was my main priority. And I kind of like shifted away from it. And then music started to change, you know, from CDs. Now, you know, now, you, you know, it was MP3s and, you know, Napster and, you know, all, all kinds yeah, of Yeah, all them stuff. people that got uh, hemmed up for downloading illegal music. And yeah. then, uh, and that, that was a pivoting point for the industry as far as um, figuring out a way to make it profitable still for the labels and the artists uh, th- that were signed, pivoting away from the actual physical copies uh, of CDs because uh, I think the MP3 uh, killed the CD. Yeah, I think um, you know the the cultural influence of the internet and uh, connected computing is obviously difficult to underestimate, and uh, our entire society has had significant, uh, I think, changes in the way we communicate and um, engage in culture, um, and I think the the music at that time and into the present day has been really heavily influenced by that. You know, now we have so many creators and that type of thing. Absolutely. Um, And so, you know, actually related to that, um, it's kind of interesting nowadays, you know, you were saying you were working the nine to five um, and uh, you know, what do you, what advice do you have for people right now that are in the place that you were there where you know, they're working that nine to five and maybe that's not their passion, but um, it's something that they, they do to, uh, to help support the other endeavors. Um, you know, so, so do you have any, any wisdom that you gained during that period about uh, priorities and that type of thing? So you, you, you gotta, you, if, if this is, if this is your dream, then you, you, you gotta put a, a thousand percent into it. But at the same time, this is a, is an expensive dream. It costs, you know, um, it costs a little bit more than they do now because now, you know, social media is a little different, but it, but it costs. Not everyone can afford it. Not everyone is in the street. Some people, you know, do decide to go nine to five. So, you know, you, you work, you take care of your, your, you know, your priorities and then whatever left over, you have to invest into yourself. Mm-hmm. You, have to, you, have to, you have to put it back into yourself. Don't look at it as, as an expense, as an investment. You put it into yourself, develop your talent. So you, you, you have to do that because you're going to be stuck. You know what I'm saying? So you gotta you gotta work because you gotta you know you gotta pay the bills. But at the same time, whatever's left over, put it into yourself because that's your ultimate goal. You know your goal is is to get out of the nine to five and pursue your dream and into the music. So yeah, you just, my advice is keep pushing, like, right? Keep pushing. So an interesting to piggyback off of that um, whole topic is you know it, it's great advice to invest in yourself, but. Being a person that was not an artist and more of a business promoter, um, investing in yourself um, in, in that way, I think artists uh, get stuck in the I need an investor type mentality. Um, with your case, did you ever hit that milestone where you're like, man, I need an investor to do a bigger show or this, that, the other, or, or were you just steady uh, doing the same business practices of what you were doing with your label as far as taking the money that you're making off the shows, reinvesting it into another show and another show and another show uh, to where you were using the money that you were making to make more things happen and bigger things happen? Because I think so many artists today and through the, the time that I've been in the music industry is – always in the mentality that they need an investor to make their, their success happen, which I, I strongly 
disagree. I, I feel, you know, if you do make an honest living working the nine to fives, you can pay your bills and use the extra money that you have to invest in your craft. And it might be a slower process than what you would like to happen, but that slower process will keep you out of prison and not pushing daisies. Well, yeah. And I, I think honestly though, too, you know, the nine to five that can actually teach you something. I mean, I know in my experience maybe is, is a little different as a personal injury and entertainment lawyer, but I know that the, um, the, uh, learning how to practice law and do well at that is helping me as I go into entertainment stuff too. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that all jobs are going to have that just the sense of diligence, responsibility, knowing how to work for somebody else, knowing how to have somebody work for you. Mm -hmm. These are all essential skills that should imbue your, your music too. Right. Absolutely. Uh, You know, it it teach you that, you know, and it teach you discipline. Like you said, you know, you know, teach you punctuality, teach you responsibility. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, you know, and not to say you can't learn that, you know, because if you, you know, if you're in the, in the streets, you go learn that too, you know, but, but, you know, it just, that whole environment, you know, it teaches you. And, 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 and that's just in life. It, everything teaches you something in life. So you just got to learn how to take what you learn and put it into what you're trying to be, you know? So, um, but yeah, during, during that time period, I still didn't know, you know, which way I was going to go. You know, uh, the music, I say everyone is in jail. I'm still doing shows because that's what's paying the bills, you know. Um, and then, you know, that kind of morphed into something else. One of my partners, you know, he came across and, you know, he made a few investments, a few businesses. Hip Hop Wilkie was one of them. And then he hit me like, yo, what you want to do? I said, let's go. And, and you know, and that's how Hip Hop Wilkie started, just like that. You know? Cool, cool. So, uh, so who was that conversation with? That, that's what my partner, um, uh, Clarence uh, C. Bradley, he's actually the CEO. Oh, okay. Cool. You know, it's my best friend. You know, we've been down since fourth grade. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Um, so know, is he so, more like the slim of the situation and you're the baby? In this situation, <laughs> you can say that, but, you know, he's he kind of taking the lead on our other businesses. You know what I'm saying? Because he knew that hip-hop and music was, like, a passion of mine. So he's like, you know. Well, you you take the lead on this one, and then you know I'll take um, the lead on this one. You know, you know, we got another our company is, is Armadale Vodka. I'll take the lead on that. You know what I mean? So right. And, you know, my, one of our other friends, you know, uh, you know, his name is Robert. He's taking the lead on something else. You know what I'm saying? So everyone has a position to play. Right. You know, collect same same people who I grew up with. You know, that's you know that's who we rocking with today. Yeah, that, I mean that's pretty amazing. The longevity. A friendship and how it's transpired into uh, business partners. You know? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, good friendships are always uh, a good foundation for that sort of thing. Um, and um, you know, so so basically, you know, in the context of of starting uh, businesses, it's always good to work with people that you're close to. But it's also important that uh, you try and reduce sort of ambiguity when you're starting your business, right? Um, and so. Um, when you guys were coming up with the ideas for hip hop weekly, um, you know, did you know it was going to be a primarily like a website or, or how did you, uh, how did the idea come to you in your head? Hip hop weekly. And first you got to remind you, like none of us got medias trained. You know, we don't, we don't know nothing about me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it, it was more, well, you do now. Yeah. And you know, the same thing with music, you know, so you have some things you got to learn on the go. You know what I'm saying? You're not going to know everything. You have to, and, and it's gonna be errors, you know, and you just can't make say can't keep continuously making the same mistake over and over again to learn from it. So oh, yeah. with Hip Hop Weekly, you know, it was it was a mag, you know, it's what well, still is a magazine because we we're going back to print, but it was a bi weekly magazine, um, who you know, who was uh ran by Dave Mays and Benzino. So it was bi weekly and you know, it was it was kind of tabloidish. You know, so how before, long was their run before uh, you and your partners took that over from Banzino. They had a great run. I, I, I think it was 07, 08. It's about maybe 2015. So a good eight, a seven, eight year run. Yeah, they had a solid run, you know, because at the time it was not, it was no such thing as a hip a hip hop tabloid. You know what I'm saying? Now, with social media, kind of slowed it down for them because now any gossip, anything, I can just go on Instagram immediate. And see it. Immediately, you know what I mean. So, if you're doing something bi-weekly, 
and you, you got to compare what something that happened every two hours, you know what I'm saying? People start to lose interest in the print. You know what I'm saying? So when we came up, you know, when we came in, social media was, was you know, was really popping at the time, especially IG. So our goal was well, we don't want nothing to do with tabloid. You know, that ain't that ain't my style anyway. So we don't want to do no gossip. We don't want to talk about no, no, no beef or anything. And we just want to go back to the culture. Okay. We go, we go back to, you know, the, you know, the elements of hip hop, the elements of music. Um, we go talk about positive things, you know, we, and we go kind of control our own narrative of what we want to put out. So if they want gossip or they want something else, they can go to shade room. They can go to, you know, Hollywood unlock. They can go to, you know, say cheese, you know, something, you know, stuff like that. Hip hop DX. But we wanted to keep it strictly on the music. Cool. So you know, it took a while, you know, to build it back up. Um, so it, it's kind of to that point now. We put out a couple of tester issues, actual print issues. We had Meat Mill on the cover, did pretty good. Um, we did one with uh, Casanova on the cover, that did pretty good. Now, what we found out was people aren't buying magazine like they used to in the general public, but in the prison industry, they love magazines. So, so now, you know, when we print now, you know, 90% of them are going to, you know, our brothers who are incarcerated, you know what I'm saying? Because they want to know what's going on, even though it's, it's some more cell phones are in prisons now, but, you know, they still want to pick it up, read it. They want to feel like they're being part of society. So what better way to do that than a magazine? So it's still it's still a market for the magazine. It just, you know, we're going to ship them to, the, you know, to our brothers and sisters who are unfortunately incar- incarcerated. And there's a small market still out here, you know, that, you know, I'm just going to do it like when we was hustling CDs, you know, go to mom and pop stores. We drop it off magazines at this store, drop it off magazines at this store. And we build it up, you know, from that way up, ground up on the print side. Yeah. So, so that's interesting. You were saying about hip hop culture. Um, what, what does that mean to you? Like uh, it, you know, obviously the music of hip hop, but then also the idea that you're trying to promote a certain culture of it. Uh, what does it What does it really mean to you? It's, it's a lifestyle. I mean, it's. I mean, it's the way you breathe. It's the way you talk. It's the way you dress. You know what I'm saying? It's. It's the way you dance. You know what I mean? It's. 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 It's a lifestyle. Hip hop is turned into. A a, a a a actual real lifestyle. You know what I'm saying? And and the culture itself is, still fairly young. You mm-hmm. know, compared to other genres. You know what I'm saying? We're talking what thirty, maybe forty years now. So we, we're all, we're born with, within this culture, you know what I'm saying? Whether we, you know, whether we embrace it or not, you know, it's there. So I think the stories that come out of hip hop, some of the stories that people don't know need to be, you know, talked about, you know what I mean? Like you would hear, oh, this person went to jail for this, or this person got a beef with this person, or but what about the things that these people are doing in their community that other media outlets aren't? highlighting you know what i'm saying what about you know uh meek mill reform you know how he's getting people you know to come home from prison and you know getting people bill uh and people sentences reduces and stuff like those are important stories to me that you might not see on other platforms you know what i mean so i just think uh when you own a, a platform it's important to control a narrative you know so you can hear all that other stuff over there but over here you go here you know uh, from a different perspective you know, you're going to hear more positivity out of the culture. And we're just not going to glorify, you know, you know the women and, the, you know, and the, all the other stuff that people just look for entertainment purposes. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I, I like that kind of infusion, the social justice kind of concern, too, that energy of righteousness and basically trying to um, use the, the culture to um, – reduce unfair sentencing and reduce that kind of um, sort of ingrained prejudice within our, the structure of our society and, and be uh, an instrument for uh, progressing uh, a vision of, of what you want culture to be, you know? Absolutely. And, 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 and it's important. Like we, that's, I think that's the responsibility of us as media to get, you know, to tell our story and who's going to tell it. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm not going to get this type of energy from a CNN or a Fox. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm going to, you know, it, it's just not there. They're not invested in it, you know, like like you know how we are. And um, 
Yeah, the hip-hop. only time that they ever cover anything on those platforms uh, due to hip hop is always negativity. Somebody got shot, somebody right. died. It's never anything positive uh, because um, that you know I'm not going to go too deep into into that specific yeah. conversation of why, but you know it, it's good to hear that you're going to use your platform that you have uh, to be able to broadcast the positive natures of what hip hop's bringing to the communities outside of uh, just the negativity that they try to promote heavy to the, uh, the especially the youth. Yeah, and, 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 and just to piggyback off that, let's just say you watch this, because I watch CNN all the time. Let's say you watch that and a negative story come up. Let's say you're not in the culture, you're not in hip hop, you listen to hip hop music, but the only perception you got of that hip hop is somebody who may have been shot or somebody who's going to court. So when you hear hip hop, you think hip hop, you always go think negativity. You know what I'm saying? So it's up to us to be able to change that because it's positive and negative in every aspect of our life. You know what I'm saying? Like, Absolutely. Bad no matter what. So let us put out that good energy. You know what I mean? Let, let, me, let us do that. And, and that was the main focus of ours with Hip Hop Weekly. You know, let's let's get away from the tabloid and the gossip and let's just put out some good energy. So going back a little bit to the record label days uh, before the Hip Hop Weekly situation came about, um, when, when did you start to see a profit and, and like moving into a more, uh, I guess, lucrative, uh, situation with your hustle and your, your music, um, attachment to the industry? I think for me, um, cause with this culture, when I started seeing big corporations and this kind of started in the nineties, but I wasn't really paying attention to that. And I've seen big corporations just kind of use hip hop to sell all their products. And I started seeing brand partnerships between these big companies and hip hop artists. You know, uh, for an example, you know, Jadakiss and, and uh, Reebok had, uh, they did something with Iverson when he dropped the Iversons. Um, Jay-Z had a deal with Reebok with the S.Doc Carters, 50 Cent with the unit brand. So when I've seen all these brands start getting partnerships and contracts with, with corporate America, I knew at that point, oh, this thing is not, it's not stopping. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's going and corporate America sees the value in it. They might not know what really is going on in culture or respect the culture, but they see the value in it and they're going to try to milk it. So yeah, brand ambassadors, yeah. most definitely. So my, my, I said, well, let me come in and figure out how, where I can get in, where I fit in. Cause instead of, you know, you know, maybe millions in, in the nineties, when the 2000s started hitting, in the 2000s, it's, it's turned to billions. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's a billion dollar industry now. So it's it's a lane for everybody to fit in. So I had to figure that out. Like how you know how are we going to fit in? And it just so happened it was from this lane, um, from the media lane. So you know this is we here now. So you, you just got to make the best of it. So that that's kind of the direction. Like prior to the the Hip Hop Weekly. Um, were you and your partners looking for a a outlet uh, of media or social, or were, were you guys scouting what was available out there for purchase or to take over instead of starting your own? We were just trying, we were just shop at this point. We were, we were just businessmen. We were just shopping and seeing, you know, what what was there in business. Period. It just so happened this was available. I'm like, hey, you know, this is this is what we live every day anyways. Let's, you know, let's see what, you know, let's see, let's jump into it. You know, same thing with the other brands, you know, it's just like, okay, this is here. And yeah. You know, like, go ahead. I'm sorry. And um, mo- most situations like that, such as like hip hop weekly and the, the, um, the Baca brand that you now are have ownership in uh, those type of situations just aren't like, freely spoken, very advertised situation. So usually you have to know somebody within a network um, to know that that opportunity even exists. Can you speak a little bit on how those opportunities came about and the people that you had conversations with to inspire those opportunities? Yeah, see, what it was is, you know, and and I tell artists when I speak to artists now, it's basically intellectual property. So I didn't know, like, like I said earlier, you know, I knew about DBAs and I started learning about LLC and being incorporated. I wasn't big on trademarks. Mm-hmm. My, my, my friend, my partner, um, you know, uh, Clarence, he was big on trademarks. So he would go and look and see what names and what stuff was available. And when, you know, when Hip Hop Weekly came in, you know, okay, it's, you know, it's there, you know. 
And then what about we a little different situation because we because we were kind of advertising Hip Hop Weekly in uh, our, our the vodka in in Hip Hop Weekly, so we kind of developed a relationship with the prior owners, and then you know we just worked something out from that point on. But you know, the Armadale though, it was like, oh man, this is this is available, you know, and, and <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Armadale was part of the culture, you know. If you if you came up in in early 2000s and you listen to Jay Z. Dame Dash and them, you know, they they were the prior owners of Armadale Vodka. You know what I'm saying? And that's when I started to notice the shift because they were promoting uh Belvedere. It was promoting Belvedere, Belvedere heavy with uh Jay-Z and Dame Dash and them. And then it's like, well, why promote this company if we can get our own company? And that's when they they purchased Armadale Vodka. Oh man. That's a, that's such a great story. Like I just love the energy of it, you know, getting out, starting a business like that. Um, and you know, you hit on a lot of cool stuff with the intellectual property. Um, and, uh, on the trademark context, we were just working on a deal, um, last week and you know, this is multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars and it got held up for a, over a month because of some trademark issues. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's very important to get on that, um, uh, trademark um, avenue quickly so you can have an attorney review the uh, availability and suitability of a certain matter to mark protection. Um, but in general, also just having an explicit strategy about your intellectual property is, is very important. Um, and, and what you're doing as, as an artist, you are creating a portfolio of property that you can um, you know, derive rent and profit from for your whole life. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so that's, that's super inspiring about Jay-Z, uh, getting that idea with the armadillo. And I, and I guess you kind of fed off that energy when you decided to do what you did. Yeah. Cause we, we fed off it. And, and it's armadillo. Cause I'm going to tell you a story about that. It's, it's a wine or something called armadillo. And we so had a, armadillo. A, yeah. Something like that. Our, yeah. The vodka <laughs> armadillo but it's a company called Arma something. And. That was, a, you know, that was being held up. Like you said, it's, it was held up because it was, the names are so close. So, yeah. so, you know, there was an opposition, like, you know, what is this? But, you know, it was like, oh, this is this and this is that. So, but, but that took like two or three years. Yeah. You know, yeah. Being, being held up. Something simple, like, because the name sounded so similar. But, yeah. But yeah. It, it was just, yeah. It was just watching, you know, your mentor, and you see a mentor promoting this product, you know, and, and they promoted the shit out of it, you know, and, and when they kind of split to see that was available, man, you know what I'm saying? So my boy made the move and, you know, and then, you know, we connected some dots and, you know, here we are. So, you know, it, that, that, you know, that should be coming fully out, you know, within the next six to 12 months, you know, we go put the, we go put the, we go put the gas on that, you know, a hundred percent. And then another uh, product that we got uh, state property because that, you know, if you, if you know, Benny Siegel, you know, he started the state property thing, but still was still part of Rocker, or, you know, the whole Rockefeller army. So that was even available. So we, you know, we bought the rights to, to state property, you know. Uh, and so you got money. Armadillo Vodka and, and now, um, so you're going to be, how are you going to be promoting that? Well, 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 you're talking about the Armadillo or you're talking about the state property? Armadale. Armadale is, you know, we're going to, um, we got, we got, we got, a, we got, we got a few things, you know. I, I, <laughs> yeah. Got to keep it on the. Got to keep it on the down low for now. Yeah, we signed some non-disclosures. I can't go into details, but it's it's. So you got some brand ambassadors that are probably going to be, uh, doing their thing for that. Ridiculous! Like it's it's crazy. And and to be honest, like I I don't know. You know, I'm just. Th this is just upfront and honest. Uh, he has not told me a thing, folks. Um, I I would assume it wouldn't be that hard to get people to uh, gravitate toward that brand, uh, knowing the history of that brand. You're right. Absolutely. Knowing the history of it, because, you know, if you listen, if you pay attention, then you, you know, it was, you know, it was well repped. So it's, people are going to grab it to, you know, it, it's just, you know, they already grab, you know, we get emails like where, where can we get it at? You know, it's not even out. You know what I'm saying? It's not even out. And, you know, the emails like where can we get it? Where can we get it? But, you know, it's, it's, it's working. It's, it's working. I, I can't wait. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be uh, huge and uh, much success to uh, that opportunity that you guys took advantage of, and, and I I can't wait to see the the fruits of the tree as it grows. Yeah, 
So, so as you grow um, that business or any of your businesses, let's talk a little bit in particular about some steps that people should take. And, uh, you know, you're an experienced businessman. You've gone through um, the acquisition of companies and their intellectual property, and you have experience now exploiting your own and others' intellectual property to make money. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what advice, you know, you have for people trying to get into uh, that space? Well, for, for that space, you you know, you have to do your, your, your due diligence. Like, I had knew nothing about this stuff. You know, I had to read. Like, a lot of this stuff they probably should teach in school. And I don't right. know if they taught it in you, you guys' school, but <clears throat> they didn't teach it in my school. You know what I'm saying? So We went over of, it in law school. <laughs> but. So a lot of this stuff, you know, it was just like I had to learn it. And I, the only way I had to learn is is by taking losses, you know. <clears throat> um, and the whole interlux of property, I, I really just got – on to that 100 percent maybe about five or six years ago you know um you know with my partner he you know he was good on it he studied that kind of stuff so he kind of schooled me to the you know importance of uh you know trademarking and making sure you go grab your websites and making sure you go grab your emails and you know your your, your social media handles and anything that's related to the brand make sure that you have control of it because these are things that is going to give you residual income <clears throat> years yeah. to come you know what i'm saying so that's important so you know piggyback what we talked about with the artists so the first time whenever artists hit me because i get you know emails tons of them first thing i ask them is okay this is your rap name do you own this name because i have known you know artists who start to pop they don't trademark their name and then it's a, it's a, a people who walk there they trademark it now you got to buy your name back from somebody who trademarked your name, you know what I mean? It's a, yeah. people do that all the time. So my first thing is when I talk to artists is, do you even own your name? And they look at me like, what do you mean? Do you own your name? Like, can, is your name a business? And a lot, nine times out of 10 is no. You know what I'm saying? So, and then, you know, I go into explaining certain things, you know, and, and then we go from there. Yeah. yeah and, and there's been many oppor- uh, or situations where artists have, uh, been presented to the labels and the labels love the music, but hate the name. So they actually rebrand the artists and sign deals. I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so basically, you know, with regards to the name, I think um, that's an interesting conversation to have. And I've had uh, in the past few weeks, multiple artists come in to get their names uh, trademarked. People often get confused about it, and they think that with a name, you get a copyright on that. But actually, the copyright is for the artistic production more, um, the songs themselves. And, and those also are obviously one of the categories of intellectual property that you have. But, but the trademark is, is very important to get at the outset, um, it, particularly in the context of hip-hop, where when you're releasing songs, if there's somebody else with the same name on Spotify that's going to mess up your plays. Your viewers aren't going to be able to find you. Um, But if you have that trademark, you know, we can make sure that they do not release under that name. Uh, You know, you can sue them and, you know, we can write them letters and that kind of thing and make sure it doesn't happen like that. That's that's important. (laughs) Like you're talking money, like you want somebody in your pockets? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting to talk about. I mean, I think – you know, from a business perspective, if you're running an art uh, entertainment type business, I mean, the value of the business grows and you've got to think about the uh, portfolio of intellectual property rights is, is kind of like a bundle of sticks, right? And there's all the different components, you know, your LLC is the full bundle, but then each of the individual sticks, you know, you've got your copyright, uh, you've got your corporate business agreement, your trademarks, um, and then your obviously bank account. your bank account and uh, your website, your website, your website and all your technology. And those, those sticks, if you keep them bundled together, they're a lot stronger than a single stick on its own. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of sticks, uh, you also have to um, fi- figure out, you know, the people that are truly uh, backers and supporters of you uh, to be able to bring your team together uh, because, you know, I've, I've heard uh, too many times, you know, people in your position stretch that the artists come up to, hey, man, put me on this or that, the other. And, you know, one of the first questions is, you know, about the, the business of, you know, owning the name and, and that section of it. And then also, you know, what's your following like? All right. What, what's your numbers like? Uh, 
what, what do you have a manager? Do you have, you know what I'm saying? And, and then it goes into them, you know, ha- having uh, those questions of who, who do you have on your team? And uh, I, I feel the people that are more organized and structured are setting themselves up for bigger opportunities because, you know, uh, su- such as a person as a stretch or any other businessman, if you come to them with a structured team, they're going to feel a lot more comfortable doing business with you than somebody that they have to, uh, you know, uh, invest a lot of time because people, you know, especially a person like stretch, the time is very limited because they have their hands in so many other business endeavors. So yeah, the time, a bus- the, you're a businessman. You yeah, got time. So, so the time, it, you know, a lot of people are like, well, why do I got to pay this to have you do this, that, the other? Well, my time, I've put a value to that time. So, you and know, you should too. Yeah. And they should too. So, you know, it's when they flip that mindset is when they'll actually start to become successful. I think in the music business and respect the music business. So speaking of the music business stretch, um, from your endeavors and uh, the the bumps in the roads and stuff like that, which which bump was like the biggest bump, but yet the 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 most rewarding because of the lesson that you learned and, and moving forward and, and to moving you in the direction of, of your success. I think um, for me, it, it was probably just just losing, losing money at a fast. Cause I was a person who I didn't have the connection. So if a person say, well, I can get you connected to this person, but you got to throw me this. I was the person who's going to pay it. You know what I'm saying? So for me, it would become, it would be that it was, it's, it's, what's the word I want to use? It's making the right, it's doing your due diligence and making the right investment. So, for me, a lot of times I put money or I, I pay to, to be linked or, or to meet somebody and it never came through. Like it was like, oh, it was just straight up fraud or, you know. And yeah, there's, uh, I feel in, especially in the hip hop community, there's so many snakes in the grass trying to, you know, feed off of the young artists. And, you know, that that's one of the, uh, I think one of the biggest value points uh, with the My Talent Checklist is every, Every uh, person within our uh, our checklist that are going to be involved in the checklist are going to be people such as Stretch uh, that are going to be vetted that, you know, can eliminate some of the, the you know, headaches that you've experienced down the road. Um, because like I was telling Trill, I had a conversation with Trill Will, and I told him, um, you know, we're, our checklist is eventually going to put those scam artists out of business. And, and that's important. And, and you said my biggest reward is, is that because when an artist come to me, I know what that feels like to, to put your money somewhere and think you're going to get something and it doesn't happen. You know what I'm saying? So I experienced that. So when a lot of artists come to me and I tell them something, they trust me because if I say I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it and I have the track record to prove it. You know what I'm saying? So if you want to meet this person, if you want to go to this studio, if you need, you know, and I'm, I'm going to make it happen for you. You know what I'm saying? And it's, and it's no BS, you know what I'm So that, that was my biggest reward is like, I had to go through that to understand it. So when I talk to these artists, I know what it feels like. So I can relate to them. Like, you know what? I'm, I've been in that position. I'm not going to put you in that same position that I was in. So a program like the, my, my talent checklist, where you can go and you got individuals involved who've experienced these things it's right there at the palm of your hand, you know? So it's, it's, it's a blessing for artists. So it's, it's listen, this, this whole, my, ch- my talent checklist is, is, is it's needed. It, it's going to put the scammers out of it. It's going to be, you know, not, you know, if you scam, that's what you do. I ain't knocking you, but it's going to make your job higher. <laughs> you know, like, you know, if you, yeah. if you can, you can come and, you know, you can speak to individuals who experience something. They're going to get you right to where you need to be. They're going to give you, a list of things that you need to take care of, and it's at affordable rate. I mean, it, it, it's it's a no brainer if, if you're an artist out here. So, yeah, you, you definitely got to tap into the whole my talent checklist. And it's yeah, yeah, and that's what we're looking to provide: flat fee, um, basically get the uh, 
the artists on board as as well as we can um, with full setups. Um, you know, we want to starting have a full, with their legal yeah, business so, setups, right? So we have a full managed services package, and basically, um, and I think that this is something that artists really need. Where you know you can basically offload all of those concerns, and you're going to get your website with a nice setup, a nice uh, electronic press kit to show people. You're going to get your business incorporated, and then you're going to get the intellectual property protections that uh, you need. Um, and, uh, and then also, um, we want to also include this idea of art artist development, right? So, um, being able to, uh, actually improve their artistic craft too, and taking that, um, challenge, uh, seriously as a business endeavor. Um, you know, how do, how, how would you say stretch, um, people can work on improving their, their actual product and what advice do you have about, um, having people develop their product? It's develop your product for me, and I always tell people I talk to is just being consistent. You know, like if, if you are an artist and this is what you want to do, then if I say spit something, you shouldn't have to go, oh, let me go grab this notebook or let me go, like, you should be ready to spit right then and there. You know what I'm saying? Because you don't know how many opportunities you're going to be. So I don't, if you, if you tell me you hot and I say, okay, I, I want to hear something. I don't want to hear, oh, let me find my music. You know what I'm saying? Okay, where's this EPK at? Send me this link. I can check all this out right here. You know, like these are things that are are valuable to an artist, you know, so being consistent is number one. You know what I'm saying? You, you got in social media is, is in this culture and in, in today's time, social media is very important. I, I always tell artists, like if you go on IG, IG is like, it's like its own TV network and your page is your channel. So every time you post, it's like a, it's like a show or a commercial. So show where, where, what you got going on. You know, wh- wh- what's this? You got something dropped? You got a mixtape you to drop? Where is that? You know, do a vlog. You know, do a behind the scenes. It should be content every day on yeah. your channel on this platform. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is your channel. You're in control of it. And I, uh, with, with the consistency, I 100% agree. And I tell artists... Uh, you know, we live in the day and age of visual content. So the the moment that you stop uh, feeding your audience content, they're going to find content elsewhere because there's so much of it. So you have to keep it, um, you know, entertaining. And, you know, um, th- there's so many artists that, that have won because of the content and not so much of their music because they, they stay engaged with the audience and, and just learning – uh, getting to learn the artists from a, pers- a personality standpoint instead of just the music, and it allows that fan to actually really uh, connect to the artist and understand maybe why they made that particular song because they paid attention to their content via IG or whatnot. So I 100% agree with that, Stretch. And, and what Stretch is telling you, artists, is you need to pay attention to what he said. Well, when you come up to him and you talk to him and, and, and he, he says, spit me something. When he's saying that, that means you need to be able to rap a 16-bar acapella off the top of the dome or spit something freestyle and have it be hot. And and for the females and, and the male artists that do the R&B, you got to be able to hit those notes right. You know what I'm saying? So practice your craft. Acapella. It's a big – I mean, that, uh, we come from the era of the old school – grind so that's what you had to do prior to the bluetooth speakers and all this accessibility of the smartphones and stuff like that to where you have to play a song to remember your lyrics no back then you had to be on point well i think you know it it brings it back to the music too i mean we were uh, out last night at an album release party for my friend for my friend ryan marquez and he's got kind of a more jazz thing going on although it's definitely got some hip-hop arrangements oh Um, yeah most definitely but but what i was at the after party um chris was spitting and did some acapella um, Acapella. with with some other uh, rappers that were there and it's just super impressive to see that and and it goes to the music thing too because then at the after party um you know we were playing some guitar and jamming and um the girl lola Uh uh, lola christine came in and she started singing on top of it and it's just so um that's that's a you know and that's what people want from music like and so if you want to be able to do music you need to be able to do music it's not just enough to you know say it's it exists you got to be able to in the moment 
allow that to happen. Have that, that, that kind of almost vulnerability, right? Like where it's like, you're on the spot doing it, you know, you're making it happen. You and are that's the music. The, so show yeah, it. Yeah. That's, that, that's, that, that's a hundred percent true. So what, what else, uh, besides the consistency, do you tell the artists? Um, the consistency. Um, you ever ask for like, Hey, uh, let me see your EPK or, you know what I'm saying? To see any of the, the business tools that they may may need outside of their social media? For, for the music side, you know, it, it's, it's consistency. Now, what I always tell them is this is the music business. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, it might be 10% music, 90% business. So if you come to me like, I'm hot, I'm hot, who are you? So I don't know who you are. Then, okay, my next question is always, well, where's your EPK? And... 50% of them don't have an EPK. You it know, kills what, me when they ask, the, the, what, what's an EPK? What is, yeah, what is an EPK? So that right there tell me that, okay, well, you got some, you know, we got to do some work because you don't even know what an EPK is. You know what I'm saying? And, That's and that my talent checklist. And could you educate us, though, uh, what is an EPK, just so that in case somebody doesn't know and doesn't want to be embarrassed? <laughs> Electronic press kit. So okay. everything that involves your brand should be in that EPK, your social media, your links to your Spotify, your links to your Apple Music, you know, your photo shoot, you know, if you got photos, you got videos, you know, your website. A well-written bio. Yeah, it's, 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 it's your, it's your brand right in your hand. You know what I'm saying? So if you trying to elevate and take your career to the next, you have to get in. If you don't know how to do that, then. My town checklist. <laughs> most definitely you hit it on you hit it on the head there it's, it's it's there you know what i'm saying so that that's important um but but yeah i mean if you if you can get that and then you know that that kind of more once you get that then it kind of morphs into other things like you know media you know or you know people who can listen to my music and you know but if you don't got your epk together that's, you know, that's kind of like step one. You know what I'm saying? You, you got to get there and then we can, we can discuss going further. And, and just for the artists, uh, understand the EPK and the structure behind the EPK of the, the items that he said, that means professional photo shoot. I get sick and tired of putting together, uh, trying to get the EPKs put together with phone photos. You need to go and reach out to your local photographer, somebody that's hot, that's doing Support videos. Support your artists. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, go and find you a professional photographer to take some good pictures of yourself. There's a, a huge difference between a iPhone, uh, Android and a professional uh, Lumix or Sony or Canon camera. Uh, uh, there, I don't want to hear the, you know, the arguments, there's a huge difference. So uh, be if you're going to be taken serious, you have to pro provide a serious product. And by doing that is having a well-written bio, having your uh, IG and, um, you know, your naming conventions be the same across the board on all the different social media platforms as well as your music platforms and ha having, uh, you know, well-developed, well-edited music videos. You know, uh, like it, there's a there's – a, easy uh, visibility to tell if an artist is serious about their craft or not. Would you agree? Quality. I mean, quality, you know, is, 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 is key. Now, sometimes you might not have a, a dope video producer or some of us, but, you know, again, that that's what we're here for. You know what I mean? Like, if, if, mm -hmm. you, if you want to get connected to a dope, you know, producer or a dope videographer, then, you know, my talent checklist is here for you. You know, it, it's all the things that you need to take your career to the next level, it, it can happen for you. You know what I'm saying? Like that, you know, it's, it's we're the bridge. So, you know, let's, it's, it's go, it's go time. So is there anything else that you would put on your own t talent checklist? Like what would you say the artist needs? And, and we talked to before about the importance of the EPK and also of uh, having the website and the business ownership structure so that, your business owns your website and the intellectual property, uh, and then the bank account. Is there anything else that you can really you would say is an is an essential? For for, for me, um, from what I've been learning, it, it for for one business is like I mean you can't do nothing with your business right now. But right, another right. Thing is making money, you know, especially if you're an indie artist, 
and you're selling music and you're selling your brand, you're selling your lifestyle. I think merch is, is important. I think as an artist, you have to have merch. You know what I'm saying? A lot of, a lot of artists make more money off their merch than they do the music. Some of them, you know what I'm saying? So absolutely. I, I think that is one, a, a key factor in your whole branding, you know, um, you know, they, they're buying into you. They're buying into your brand. They're buying into your lifestyle. So have as many products available for them to purchase than just the music. You know what I'm saying? If it's a short film, you know, you know, if, you know, if, if you got some cups, you know, with your logo on it, like, you know, some pens, but you know, whatever, like Pope, like. Branded. And I think artists need to really think about the logo design and, and how you can um, translate your, your artist brand into an actual logo brand. Uh, you know, of whatever creative design, rather it be a font or a, uh, some type of image uh, created to represent your brand. Uh, I think that's very, um, very important for artists to, you know, obtain that logo, which then again uh, ties into the intellectual property of their business. Yeah, it's kind of full circle. You know, it kind of like everything kind of runs into each other. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, and it, it's there for you. You know, it's there for you, man. It's like, you know, and, and I, I, I have one other uh, thing to, you know, add to that checklist is I, I think uh, artist management is a huge uh, choice and decision for the artists and finding. Uh, so, so talking about the, uh, the management, uh, what kind of advice would you give to an artist when going to uh, select management stretch? Don't, don't, a lot of artists think their management is supposed to um, be their investor or they're supposed to pay for everything. Like a managed, a management is going to do exactly what that is. They're going to manage whatever you have in front of them. You know, so if you're a photographer, or if you're a videographer, if you're a producer, they're going to manage your product. So whatever your brand is, that's their job. So a lot, I hear a lot of artists like, well, I signed this manager. They didn't put no money into me. They, well, they're not really supposed to, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Unless if you want somebody to put up money into, then you're looking for a, a label situation. You know what I mean? Like it's like a lot of people kind of get the two confused. But um, I think a man, you have to first it has to be somebody that that you can build because this is a person you're gonna be talking to every day. So you're gonna have to have some type of relationship with them. You're gonna have to trust them. So that that's the biggest thing. You know, uh, usually management managers and and. And the managees always fall out. It's usually something about trust or somebody did something they wasn't supposed to. So it has to be somebody that, that's trustworthy. Um, yeah, I, I would say, you know, you just have to have that feeling. You know, you got to gotta do your due diligence, research them, see who else they manage, see what else they got going on. So, you know, so do you feel like maybe a family member is a good uh, manager or would you steer away from that particular situation? Because I, I've, I've seen uh, artists... Uh, time and time again, you know, they'll, they'll have like their mom or dad or somebody manage them. And it, it comes to a breaking point. Um, and unfortunately, it happens like this, uh, where, you know, say they're hot, they get ready to blow up and they go to the labels and they get ready to sign a deal. That label can specifically in their contract and uh, in the meeting tell, tell you that uh, that manager's service is no longer needed. Yeah, yeah, and, and then it, that also, what I noticed, just, just piggyback what you said, like, you might have a family member that's managed you. They get you to this point, like you just said. Now you're at this point where somebody's trying to sign you. Now a label don't want to deal with your manager. They don't want to deal, you know, with whatever situation. You know, as an artist, you got to be able to make that, make those choices, make those decisions. That's when, you know, you might have to, at this point, go holler at a, listen, this is my manager. You got a good relationship with your manager, the label don't want me to keep this. Like, what can your attorney do at this point? You exactly. Know yeah. That's when you need the attorney. And, and that's a I've, key word. And I, I, I appreciate him actually pick, uh, you know, picking that word and pulling that word into the conversation. I was waiting for it stretch because a lot of artists don't understand. They, they get these uh, deals presented in these situations to set down with um, the, the big uh, labels and they, they just think paperwork immediately, and where where can I sign without even thinking? Yeah, hey, need I need to, to have... go talk to Mr. Joe Savat right, at right. Ott Law Firm uh, to get me right. 
Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, uh, you should never read something without having, a, or uh, never sign something without having the lawyer look over it in that in that context. Um, and basically, you know, with the My Talent Checklist product, I mean, we want to get you to the point where you're getting investors like that. Um, and, uh, you know, if you have your portfolio of your product under control in advance of that, it makes the uh, makes that investment significantly easier from their perspective, the record company's perspective. And it also gives you leverage because at that point, your business has been consolidated. Your intellectual property portfolio has a defined value. And if they're trying to shortchange you in some way, you can very easily negotiate with them. Mm -hmm. You come from a position of strength and um, certainty rather than merely being happy happy that they're giving you any money at all. You know, you want to be uh, in a position where you can get the best deal possible, uh, retain control over exploiting your intellectual property, um, and, uh, and, and have full uh, control of the vision um, to the extent that you can, you know, with their advice and make sure that they're an actual partner with you. They're not uh, going to own you. Yeah. And, <laughs> and when he says ownership stretch, I, I, you know, uh, I've seen too many situations where, artists sign these deals and you know, it's a full 360 deal and you know that they, you basically just signed your life away and you're going to be making pennies uh, right. of the, the money. And, and what's so messed up is if they front load you X amount of dollars, they're oh, going to, they're going to put a percentage on what they're going to get and what you're going to get on top of uh, you. It's so like, just read your contract. And have an attorney read your contract because you do not want to set for the next five years, ten years, and make no money and get all happy because you went out and spent spent your uh, advance. And, and I love the fact that, uh, Joe, you, you use the word investment. Um, and the investors, uh, artists need to understand that a record deal is no uh, – they, they camouflage the, the word for loan – into record deal. Um, right. They are basically the bank and you're paying that loan back. And if you don't pay that loan back, they actually own you and your music career is basically shelved. Right. Absolutely. And, and, and the good thing about my talent, my talent checklist is like Joe, you mentioned a, a, a great word leverage. Like you follow the, the, the steps on my talent checklist will give you leverage. So if you are an independent artist, if you are a, a any label and you you about to sit down with these labels, if you follow these steps, you're going to have that leverage that you need. Now you're negotiating. Now you're not coming here as an artist. You're coming here as a business partner. You don't want to get signed. You, you want to be a partner with the labels because you just like you said. If you if you if you if you you're going to be in debt, you know if they front you this 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 money up front, you got to pay that money back. That money comes off the top before you can split do any splits. They get that money back. So a lot of artists sign these deals and they're in a hole. No, build your leverage up. Then go. Then go sit down. You know and. Yeah, and, and no know. recourse. They should have no recourse against you. Your business should be so well established that yes. they're investing you in the business. This is not a personal loan. This is you're giving me money to run my business, and we'll give you a cut of it. You know, that's a different situation than here's a personal loan for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And that's what uh, and and those legal technicalities are super important. Um, and this is, you know, actually, so this is perfect about just the LLC and, and corporate ownership structure. I mean, you do not, um, you know, if you're practicing as a business, then you are shielded from that personal liability. And now in, in this situation with a, with a label, it may be different depending on the particulars. But the point is you need to educate yourself to, to get to that point where you are informed as to what your rights are and you have um, the intellectual capacity. Uh, basically uh, capital you have the team in place that will allow you to negotiate from a per position of strength and with the my talent checklist uh and the association uh, that the artist will have in doing business with the my talent checklist they will have representation of course uh, of yes, yes, yes. a attorney that they can reach out to at that time uh instead of trying to find an attorney and not have a well-established relationship because we'll 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 have uh, establish that relationship from the start to the finish of the steps through the My Talent Checklist leading up to the uh, situation where uh, if an artist pursues getting a deal, that they'll have that 
that um, core relationship already built with myself, your uh, yourself, and Stretch. Yeah, for sure. Which, which is uh, tremendous uh, value in itself. Yeah. Just the relationship. Yeah. So, so guys, um, let's try and I think, uh, you know, it's been going for about an hour now and, um, you know, we'll be back every week. Um, and we're working to put out a lot of cool content. Um, later this year, we're going to be doing, um, some, uh, private informative interviews that we're going to have on the site. Um, and we're going to be giving a lot of powerful educational content that will help artists to understand the, uh, the necessary prerequisites to mm -hmm. their having the, the best success that they can. Um, and really, you know, this is all in the interest of helping people to make beautiful things. And we want to help you be able to make the most powerful art that you can. Um, and that you, you can have, um, that, uh, life that you want to live basically and help you to, to own what you're doing. Um, yeah, most definitely. Do, do you have anything else you want to talk about stretch or any, uh, shout outs you want to give? Yeah. Um, I, I do got to give a couple of shout outs. Um, first I have to get a shout out to, you know, my whole team, my, my whole team with hip hop weekly is 90% women. Um, <laughs> they, they all, you know, it's, it's the great they, Carly Granger. <laughs> they keep me on my, my toes. They, you know, it, you know, they sharp. Um, so I, I have to show my appreciation. Um, for, you know, for them, starting with my editor in chief, uh, Cash Jones, my brand manager, Radio Red Rocks, uh, Michelle Visa, everyone involved with the radio. Of course, my partner, C. Bradley, Robert Welch, um, um, and you know, and I, the word that that keeps sticking out to me after tonight is um, is leverage. You know, with, with the whole my talent check. Like, I think if you want to go to the to the next, and if you if you're looking for a record deal, I mean we can provide you the leverage that you need to negotiate, um, you know, and get your career to the next level. If you're looking for a record deal, um, you know, independent, we, you know, we can help you that way as well. So leverage, we, you know, I think that's, that's like the word of the night for me. Okay, cool. Thanks, Stretch. I appreciate that. What about you, Chris? You got any shout outs you want to give? Uh, I just wanted to, you know, give my shout out to Stretch for taking his time out of his busy schedule uh, to sit down with me and Joe uh, this evening. Uh, I look at, some beautiful situations coming in the near future. Uh, uh, before the call, uh, you know, we got on the Zoom and, and make, making sure that everything was everything. And uh, Stretch informed me and Joe about, um, uh, what is it, AC3? A3C. A A3C in uh, Atlanta. So, um, you know, look for My Talent Checklist and uh, Hip Hop Weekly to be heavily involved um, in, in campaigning and uh, marketing and giving opportunities uh, for, you know, you to get involved and get engaged with both Hip Hop Weekly and uh, My Talent Checklist. Uh, big, yes, shout out, big shout out to the Ot Law Firm and uh, to, you know, all the brand ambassadors, a &Rs, artists that are affiliated and uh, in the network of Full Circle Music Group. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just really wanted to, you know, tip my hat off to you, Stretch. Uh, it was a pleasure meeting you and how you know, the world and, and the universe aligned the three of us to be in the same um, room uh, to be able to have those set downs and those conversations to lead us up to this point and to where we're going in the future. So I'm, I'm yeah, sure. really excited about it. Yeah, so guys, tune in next week. Um, you can also check out our website, mytalentchecklist.com. Um, and um, there's there's some links on there to, uh, to my law firm too. And, you know, so if anybody has any questions about anything um, and uh, wants to schedule anything else, just feel free to reach out. Um, and we'll be back bringing more valuable content with you guys about um, hip hop uh, and entertainment business law um, and trying to have success as an artist. Um, so yeah, thanks most everybody. definitely. And, and before we leave, I want to go ahead and uh, just give a little rundown of who we have coming up here in the uh, month of September. Next Sunday, uh, September 12th, we'll have Preach from St. Louis okay. in the building. Yeah. Um, September 19th, we'll have uh, VIP, uh, I think how you say her name is VI Peach. Uh, she's a female hip hop artist from Cincinnati, Ohio. I uh, wanted to give a big major shout out to her. And uh, S September 26th, we have Big B from BBMG Music Group uh, down there uh, close to Miami, Florida. So uh, I really look forward to talking to the CEO of BBMG. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, awesome. That's one of Trill Will's uh, partners that um, they partnered him and Celebrity D DJ YG with uh, this um, CEO. He actually did uh, uh, 
personal security for some of the top hip hop artists, such as like 50 Cent, Jay Z, uh, his his security group uh, before he got into the uh, hip hop world. So that's going to be a, a cool perspective and business uh, conversation as well. So that's what we have coming up uh, next three Sundays. And I appreciate everybody tuning in. Once again, this is Chris Will signing off. My Talent Checklist, Joe Savat. And we got Mr. Stretch in the building, Hip Hop Weekly. I appreciate everybody tuning in. All right. Until next Sunday. Later, guys. Peace.